Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think it's time to uh, open our uh, fall membership meeting. Uh, I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of the coalition, and uh, I am so pleased you're all here. Uh, I can't tell you how pleased I am that you're all here, having been, you know, watching uh, odd moments on the Weather Channel over the past 48 hours. Um, I particularly congratulate those of you who uh, made your way through some of the uh, inclement weather in the middle of the country. And um, all I can say is I think you're going to find the trip was worthwhile. Um, I've got a number of things to do before I get into my, um, uh, my uh, main topic here, which is to uh, look back over recent developments and discuss our 2010-2011 uh, program plan. Uh, I do want to take a moment to particularly um, welcome our international visitors. Uh, I know that um, as challenging as getting around this country is, getting around the world is even more challenging. And I know we have a number of international visitors with us. Um, a special welcome to you. Uh, I also want to recognize um, our colleague from uh, the LIBOR organization. For those of you who aren't familiar with LIBOR, um, they are very similar to the Association of Research Libraries for uh, Europe. And um, Walter uh, Schaller, their director, I believe is here. Um, I had an opportunity to join them at their annual meeting uh, earlier this year, and I'm delighted that, they're, that uh, we're able to have these uh, connections with our colleagues in Europe. So uh, welcome. I want to also take a moment to introduce um, someone to you all. Uh, I hope she's here, um, and uh, we're going to find out. Um, every uh, year, C and I, um, working together with um, with our colleagues um, at ARL and Educause. Um, award the Paul Evan Peters Fellowship. This is a fellowship for a graduate student in um, information science or library science um, that was established in the memory of the late Paul Peters. And we look for a kind of a special person for this, someone who not only has the scholarly and intellectual credentials and goals that you'd certainly look for, but someone who in their, repre in their um, statement resonates with the things that made uh, Paul Peters so special, um, his commitment to civic responsibility, democracy, imagination, and humor. And uh, we found a wonderful awardee for 2010, um, Jess Knopfler, who is a um, doctoral student at the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland College Park. And I believe she has been able to join us, and if she's here, would she uh, give a give a wave? <laughs> Congratulations! Um, understand, by the way, I can't see anything past the first couple of rows because of these lights. So I, I rely on you all back there to help. Um, the last thing, by way of sort of introduction, I want to do is. On is, is another um, recognition. Believe it or not, CNI is actually celebrating its 20th anniversary. Um, I sort of, you know, just take a deep breath every time I say that uh, because one way or another, I have been involved since the earliest days. Uh, 
when uh, Paul and a uh, key group of leaders in higher education uh, pulled this organization together. Um, today, I want to honor one of those people, um, Richard West, uh, formerly of the University of California, now in an emeritus role at the uh, California State System. Richard was there at the beginning. In fact, there is a wonderful, wonderful story, which I will tell um, and probably get wrong, um, about how the, two, the leaders of the two predecessor organizations to uh, Educause, Jane Ryland and Bob Hederick, before the two merged, um, appointed Richard as sort of their emissary from the um, CIO perspective to go and approach Dwayne Webster, uh, who's now the um, executive director emeritus of ARL, about joining forces to put the coalition together. And as it was wonderfully described at a uh, feshrift for Dwayne about a year or two ago, um, Richard went into his office and came out and wasn't sure who had sold who what. Um, uh, but um, that's how these things get established and how uh, good ideas, you know, gel among the leadership. Richard has just completed an astounding and unprecedented uh, 20 years of service leading the CNI Steering Committee um, and has, through those 20 years, been a fabulous source of advice, leadership, um, uh, support, um, and uh, uh, has been one of those people without which I am quite sure we would not be where we are today. And uh, we've got a memento for him, which both he and I are afraid to touch, so we're just going to kind of point at it here um, and then ship it to him. But uh, Richard, thank you for all that you've done, and uh, join me in thanking Richard. And now, let me go right from there into um, some conversation about um, the program plan for the coming year and some of the things that have been happening. And the 20th anniversary, I think, is a good place to start. We've been talking, actually, with our steering committee for about a year or so now about what we might do to observe that 20th anniversary. And we've kind of gone back and forth about it a little bit. There was some thought that we might, you know, do something looking back historically at all the things we've achieved um, and at some of the things that have happened over those 20 years. But I think I, I felt, and I think the steering committee also felt that really the right thing to do would be to focus on the future, to think of those past achievements only as prologue. Um, that really what we should be doing to mark that 20th anniversary is something that looks forward to our 40th anniversary as much more than looking back over our first 20 years. So what we're going to do over this program year and part of the next is we're going to put together an ebook. And we're tentatively titling that the next 20 years. And it will probably have some lengthy subtitle, which we haven't quite figured out yet. Um, but it's really intended to be sort of analytic, predictive. 
it's really not about scenarios. Um, scenarios are something that people do often to help understand the future. In fact, um, ARL has just done a splendid set of scenarios um, about the uh, future of the research enterprise. And uh, we actually will have a session talking about those for people who are interested in scenario planning. But here I'm thinking much more about trying, not, not about looking at outliers, but trying to look at where we're likely to go over the next 20 years and what the key issues are, and to look fairly broadly. Um, the future of higher education, of course, of scholarship, of information technology, of communication and media. All of these will be on the table. Um, it's hard to really talk about these, though, without um, talking in some cases more broadly about changes in society. We've certainly seen and been reminded again and again over the last 20 years that you know, higher education and scholarship are not disconnected from the economy, from changes in the social fabric, um, from changes in the, um, in the geopolitical nature of the world even. Uh, so, um, you know, we will go into those as needed. Why 20 years? We kind of debated this around a little bit, especially in light of, um, uh, of, you know, is 20 years just a convenience because it's our 20th anniversary? And I actually felt like 20 years is about the right length of time. Um, there's actually, you know, a whole literature on predicting the future, and I've always really enjoyed future predictions, understanding full well how perilous it is. Um, there's a tendency often to overestimate change in the short term, to underestimate it in the long term. Um, there are different kinds of failure modes. There's a wonderful book that Arthur Clarke wrote about predicting the future where he tries to parcel them out, for example, into failures of imagination and failures of nerve. In other words, not having the um, the confidence to actually predict that the things you, you can imagine would happen. Um, 20 years kind of feels like it's in the right spot to me. Um, it's, it's not moving into science fiction, but it's long enough that we can look for things that are more than incremental change. So that's what we've settled on. And here's how we're going to proceed on this. Um, I'm going to prepare an initial opening essay for this. Um, and uh, hoping to have that done by the spring meeting um, or thereabouts. And we'll put that up on the web. And we're going to invite everybody who wants to write essays building on that or responding to that um, or challenging that to feel free to do so. They don't have to be enormously long essays. Part of my hope in writing that opening essay is to frame things a bit and uh, to be able to entice people in because they're not just starting completely with a blank slate. And we'll reach out to uh, many of the people, not just here today, um, but people who've done keynotes for CNI meetings in the past, people um, in some cases perhaps outside the CNI community. And as these come in over the remainder of two, 2011, we will accumulate them up on a website and then Towards the end of 2011, hopefully um, in time for next December's meeting, we will take that opening essay and a selection of the contributed essays and we will package them up as an ebook. Um, 
will probably also provide some kind of print on demand um, uh, at cost uh, arrangement for that ebook. We haven't worked out all the details of that yet. We will, of course, leave all of the um, all of the contributed um, uh, essays on the website, but we want to kind of have a finite book out of it that's of manageable size um, uh, that people can um, can treat as a book. And uh, I'll, I'll probably write a sort of a concluding chapter that tries to tie together some of the um, some of the submitted essays as well. So I'm hoping that by the end of calendar 2011, uh, we'll be able at our um, at our uh, fall meeting to have that as a sort of a um, recognition of our 20th anniversary and as an opportunity for us all to look ahead to what the next 20 years may bring. Um, and I hope that one of the things that it will do, honestly, is to provide a little bit of offset from the focus that many of us have been dealing with over the last uh, couple of years, which has been, I think, unusually short term for our community because of the various budget and organizational pressures we've been uh, facing and the need to respond very rapidly to those stresses. Uh, clearly, strategic planning, you know, proceeds in cycles where sometimes you are more short term and sometimes you're more long term. Um, I think that when you look to, at some of the things that we were doing as a community five, seven years ago, they did have a somewhat longer term um, uh, horizon on them, and I think it would be useful to inject some of that thinking um, back into our strategic work. I also um, think that uh, when you look at some of the very um, abrupt changes that we've dealt with over the past few years, they actually have, and I think we all know in our guts that they have long-term ramifications, um, not just short-term responses that really need to be thought through on a strategic basis. So I really hope that this project will help us to do that as well. So. I look forward to working with you on this effort. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and I hope it's going to be uh, a truly intellectually stimulating um, uh, uh, work that produces a significant result going forward. I think you know that it really is a particularly useful and fruitful time to start thinking about some of these longer term things. Um, I was really struck as I worked um, on this talk and I worked through my notes um, about thing, notable things or things that really caught my attention that had happened in the past year that I wanted to mention in the context of our program plan. Um, there really are some very interesting things happening in the world out there, some terribly unexpected things, some things that, you know, if you asked me about five years ago, I would have said probably um, belonged more in the realm of science fiction or at least, uh, you know, techno thrillers or something than actually happening out there. Um, but. Uh, I really want to try and, as I talk through some of our programmatic areas, also take a few little detours related to them into some really quite striking things, um, quite incredible things that are happening out in the world. So the place I want to start is with cyber infrastructure, e-science, the no e-scholarship the fundamental notion that we've been working with in the last few years, that high performance networking, the integration of sensors and experimental apparatus, high performance computing, um, very large scale storage, software that facilitates collaboration, virtual research environments, uh, virtual organizations, is gonna change the way we do scholarship change the way we document scholarship, 
change fundamentally the way we communicate scholarship. And I think you can already see, um, uh, you know, big steps happening in areas around there. Um, if you just look at the underlying networks, um, we've already seen in this past year uh, the emergence of the plan for sort of the next, um, the next level of backbone networking coming out of organizations like National Lambda Rail and Internet 2. We're now talking about relatively routinely provisioning um, uh, research groups with dedicated um, uh, 10 gigabit or higher um, data paths to move data. Um, we're actually seeing, you know, the serious integration of sensors with networks in various ways. Um, <coughs> imagine a world where somebody can see something and call for help in understanding it, and they can get help. They can. Um, establish a collaboration in a matter of a minute by marshalling up observational apparatus around the world to look at an event. We're actually moving into those kind of territories and we're seeing this in other places too, not just scholarly work. Um, I don't know if you've uh, been following some of the um, discussion over the past year or two about so-called high-frequency trading in the stock markets. Basically, the deal here is that the action is getting so fast that the speed of light matters and how close you are to the exchange computers and whether you can co-locate and whether you can get direct fiber or there's a router in the way, uh, you know, uh, regenerating a packet across multiple spans of fiber actually makes a difference. Um, this is the new world of fast networks and, uh, you know, again, this is the sort of thing you would never have imagined this, or I certainly wouldn't have a few years ago, that, you know, speed of light would become an issue in a context like that. If we look, though, at perhaps the area of greatest interest to many of us here, it's data curation and how we manage and ensure the reuse of data that is produced by scholarly work. And here probably the big milestone was the October announcement by the National Science Foundation that effective January 2011, they were going to require data management plans for, um, for uh, proposals that were submitted to the foundation. In this, they joined the National Institutes of Health, which has had a somewhat similar, although not as comprehensive, uh, requirement in place for a couple of years. This is a major step because it brings researchers across a very wide range of disciplines who are at our institutions face-to-face -face with the question of how do I inventory the data products that come out of my work? How do I make judgments about what are likely to be important? For the ones that are important, where do I go to find services and assistance in documenting and mounting and preserving and making available these data sets. Um, simply making that conversation happen across a very wide range of disciplines is a tremendously important step. And I would note that I think it's very likely that you will see other funders follow directly in the footsteps of NIH and NSF over the next couple of years. Um, I think you'll see other federal funders stepping up here. Certainly many private funding uh, bodies are, are, are already um, starting to take positions here. Now, I want to note that there's still an awful lot to do here. Um, one issue, just a little you know, detail, is actually getting services in place to support these researchers. 
uh, at a campus level, at a disciplinary level. This means everything from helping them to do the intellectual analysis to helping them to carry out, to actually execute the plans they put in place. There are some serious um, uh, unresolved problems with some of what the um, funding agencies are doing. One issue is that the guidance that they're giving researchers is terribly general. Um, another is that if review panels are supposed to be taking these data management plans into account in assessing the merit of proposals, they probably could use some guidance about what makes a good data management plan and what makes a bad data management plan. Um, we need to find ways to do this. In fact, one way to think about what's going on is that this is a sort of a great collective experiment um, at the same time that it's an important shift in policy. Uh, one of the things that I think could be a very, very useful step would be to try and make arrangements to get a database of the data management plans for successful proposals. My understanding is that those are public, um, that once, once proposals fund this kind of material becomes, um, becomes public. And to, to um, use these as a basis for trying to analyze um, uh, what we should be doing going forward and to get a better grip on the needs of various institutions and various disciplines to find out how many researchers might be served by profiling or templating approaches which um, simplify the kinds of management they need to do on their data because it's of a sort of an, ident uh, an identifiable and relatively well standardized genre as opposed to very much one-off things. Um, you'll see some thinking in some of the presentations here about um, uh, over the course of the next day and a half about early institutional responses to this. But I think that um, this is a tremendous challenge and a tremendous opportunity and really represents a sort of a, a milestone in um, making a lot of this rhetoric about data being as important as publications a much more tangible kind of an issue. Now, I also want to note that we don't have a real good understanding of life cycles of data. Um, in particular, um, we don't really know how long a lot of different kinds of data should live. Um, this we're going to need to understand as well. I think one of the things, though, that is promising um, maybe a good sign here is that um, I'm not hearing words like forever, perpetuity, life of the republic, um, you know, eternity um, used a lot in the data curation um, context. If you look at the early guidance out of NSF, for example, um, they, they, they're sort of talking a few years after the completion of the grant, like three, five. Um, you're, you're hearing, you know, conversations about, well, in the short term for reproducibility and then in a few, for at least a few years um, for someone to be able to pick up the work. Now, I don't want to suggest that that's for all data. Obviously, there is data that is used particularly in collective ways, contributions to GenBank. Um, meteorological observations that form part of a, um, you know, permanent uh, corpus of time series meteorological observations. Um, there are lots and lots of things like that that obviously we're not going to toss out in um, two or three years. But this notion of um, sort of um, uh, the, the starting point for the negotiation is keep everything forever. Um, uh, doesn't seem to be on the table. And that's a really good thing because we really don't know a lot about how to keep everything forever, either economically or technically. 
We're actually pretty good, though, at keeping bits for five years. And five years or six years is around the plausible horizon where you can probably get away without even having to do a format migration in most cases. So maybe we're being led into this in a, um, in a kind of an incremental way, for better or for worse. And uh, I, think, I think maybe for better because um, these are challenging enough things that involve building up um, uh, collaborations and trust relationships, um, and it is good to take them a step at a time. I would be remiss to not recognize the open data movement that's showing up kind of in course in direct conjunction with this. The whole idea that scientific data should be open, should be shared, um, that we should find ways to do that, um, and that that should be recognized both in the norms and values of scholarly disciplines and in the policy framework within those, w within which those disciplines function in society more broadly. Um, I think that that is gaining inexorable traction in many areas, and um, you actually can point to remarkable developments here. Uh, for example, the pooling of, um, of data among pharmaceutical companies and, um, uh, and among um, uh, university academic researchers uh, through mechanisms like the Sage Bioinformatics Commons or the work that was done recently in identifying uh, markers for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, these are these are things that you know would have been intractable barriers a few years ago, and I think show how much um, thinking is shifting here. One of the areas where I don't think we're paying enough attention, though, is to software. Much of this data is inexorably connected to software that interprets it and uses it. And in fact, one of the um, very interesting streams of development that I'm starting to recognize emerging um, is really around transparency and reproducibility. Um, there are researchers like Victoria Stoddard, for example, who are doing some very compelling and disturbing work on the erosion of reproducibility in scientific research because of the complexity of the software environments and the data analysis that underpins these, um, uh, making it very difficult even for researchers to reproduce their own results sometimes. Um, recently, there, uh, there's been a recognition of how important simulation and modeling have become. Um, basically, data, software, and literature all coming together into models, and the notion promoted by folks like Ian Foster, for example, that we should be moving towards um, models of, in areas that are of great public interest that really are open and where everybody can inspect the model, run the model themselves, change the parameters on the model if they want to, um, and compare their results. Um, uh, you're seeing this discussion, for example, in climate modeling, where there seems to, where of course there are very high stakes decisions being made now about climate models and climate change, and where there seems to be some move from proprietary models to more open models. Um, we really do seem, in fact, to be entering a sort of an age of very large-scale simulations. Um, I can remember uh, as a um, much younger person uh, back in the, oh, uh, the mid-70s, um, running into people uh, like Wassil Leontiev, who wanted to do a model of the world economy. And at least back then, this was really quite challenging. Um, uh, you really didn't have enough data to do it right. I mean, you could do sort of macroeconomic models. People have been doing that for years, but the resolution was not what you would like. Now you actually are seeing things like a proposal that I was looking at recently um, 
led by a team out of ETH in Zurich, um, a fellow named Dirk Helbing and his colleagues. They're asking the European Union for a billion euros of funding to basically build a very large scale simula social simulation of um, a number of processes uh, having to do with global civilization, economic, transportation, agricultural. And they've actually worked their way through this to come up with roughly 70 major databases that are around right now that are huge, um, which would provide a pretty good level of input to this. And you've actually got the computational horsepower now to do these kind of simulations at detail. Um, we're actually seeing the emergence in the social sciences broadly of new kinds of simulation infrastructure, um, these huge multi-agent uh, things that are geographically keyed, which I think are going to be both new kinds of scientific instruments, new objects to drive, pub new data sources to drive public policy, um, and are gonna play a hugely important role. I think we really need to think about how we're going to manage the documentation of, of these kinds of things. Now, it's getting, as those comments should suggest, to be a pretty strange world out there in terms of artifacts that make a difference. Um, one of the other areas where we've been active this year and will continue to be active is in um, digital preservation. And by digital preservation, part of what I want to suggest is very much in scope is striving for a continued understanding of what actually constitutes our sort of collective social and intellectual record. Um, one of the places where there's been a very powerful ongoing conversation uh, over the past few years has been the changing nature of news as it moves away from very fixed sort of things to these continually updated databases, how you actually document news and news flow and the evolution of news when something happens and there's a series of successive um, uh, reports as more is learned and clarity is gained. Um, the Library of Congress, as part of its NDIP program, has led some very important inquiries in there. Um, and in fact, did one um, earlier this fall on the future of community journalism. Uh, community journalism actually you can think of, and um, we can get into the distinctions um, uh, later um, if, if for those who are really into this, as kind of a form of social network. And one of the things that you know certainly is unquestionable is, just as you may or may not like video games, if you look at the number of hundreds of thousands of hours a year that people spend playing them, um, it would be pretty hard to justify not documenting them as an important aspect of our culture today. Um, same deal with social media. And in fact, we are starting to see serious thinking and a bit of action about how we are going to document and preserve social media. Uh, you may have seen the announcement that the Library of Congress is getting the Twitter archive. And there are scholars who are very interested in what can be done with that. Um, uh, you know, at, at first glance, um, there was some questions raised about, you know, do we really need to archive this? Well, yeah, we probably do. First on that principle of simply amount of time spent on it. But secondly, um, people actually, I think, underestimate and misunderstand how powerful these things are. I saw an incredible and kind of frightening analysis um, earlier this year about the role that Twitter specifically played in orchestrating um, uh, civil protest in Iran after the last election. 
Um, and, uh, you know, the, you, you could actually, people had visualizations of how the word spread from one, to, one person to another on there. Unfortunately, you could also imagine the secret police running the same visualization in darn near real time there. Um, so yes, these kinds of tools are important. In fact, not only are they important retroactively, but here's another kind of interesting thing that's showing up. It's actually turning out that some of the social media, and I'm using social media in the very broad sense to include um, search systems if you can sit in a place like inside of Google watching all the search queries go by, in which case this kind of becomes a social media that's visible to you and not visible to anybody else. Um, it turns out these things are predictive. They're not simply subject to retrospective analysis. Um, there have been a whole series of papers recently by people like Hal Varian, the chief economist at Google, with titles like Predicting the Present, at, where basically they look at query streams or on Google or Twitter streams or other sorts of things, and they discover that actually these are good predictors of things, like how much a movie is going to gross in its first weekend. It actually does better than the auction market that Hollywood had been using and other people had been using to estimate this. It's pretty good with books and music. It turns out that it's not very good at predicting the stock market, although arguably um, that's, that's sort of too general a thing and maybe if you frame it in, a, in much narrower ways it is. Um, uh, but um, there have been studies done there. Um, here's another one. So uh, it turns out that Google has been working with the Centers for Disease Control. And the idea is that they want to be able to predict um, particularly infectious disease outbreaks. And they've used this to predict flu outbreaks or if not predict, identify, you know, somewhere right on that cusp of identify and predict. And the way they do that is they look at people putting in queries about symptoms. All of those queries, or most of them, are geolocated. There is so much data here that a little noise hardly matters, you know, so you get the geolocation wrong once in a while or uh, tag the wrong thing. You actually get something with some correlation there. And flu is pretty hard, I would suggest, for doing this um, because uh, flu is a reasonably familiar thing for most people. If you think about a more um, unusual infectious disease with, um, you know, somewhat less commonplace symptoms, I would suspect that this um, has much more powerful um, uh, resolution for identifying outbreaks. So we're actually starting to see some of these social scale um, media turning out to have predictive powers which are going to, I think, be very interesting competitive advantages for various players. Um, it is interesting to me how um, difficult it is to look at many of these in the context of academic social science research because of the, possibility, the complexities that human subjects constraints can involve here. Um, but it's clear that something very new is happening here, very powerful, and that we really do need to come to grips with how we manage these kinds of things. Um, I'd throw out, you know, just one other example here about, um, uh, you know, how curious this kind of world of public data is getting. Um, WikiLeaks. All of a sudden, these enormous dumps of data on the net um, that 
presumably has some substantial um, uh, value in illuminating historic activity, public policy, things like that. Um, we certainly see in a closely allied area, um, libraries starting and universities starting to move into the area of the stewardship of records of um, human rights violations. And that has proved to be a very important, but also a very dangerous area, um, as uh, there are people who are unhappy about the existence of those records, um, much as there are people who are unhappy about the um, availability of Wikilinks. Um, I will spare us the uh, question of um, how many libraries have decided that they should capture a copy of the WikiLeaks archive as um, part of their research collections going forward. Um, but I think these are exactly the kind of um, puzzles that we're going to be dealing with. And, um, you know, um, Again, just to go a little farther out there, it's been very interesting to see the um, level of viciousness that has occurred in some of the um, network attacks surrounding uh, WikiLeaks and the um, termination of funding to WikiLeaks by various credit card organizations and things like that. The network is actually getting to be a um, vicious place sometimes and in different ways than it used to or more extreme ways than it used to. Um, how many of you have seen uh, the reportage on Stuxnet? That ring any bells? I see just a handful of hands. Um, this was a computer worm I think would probably be the best way to describe it that turned up a few months ago except that it turns out it was actually targeted at some very specific kinds of electronic control systems that seem to be used, among other things, for controlling large collections of centrifuges, refining uranium. Um, this was a very complicated and very, you know, sort of precisely designed thing. Um, uh, that really seems to have been targeted to very specific places. And it's not entirely clear where it came from. Um, it is anything but clear whether it actually worked and what effect it had. Um, but it begins to, uh, you know, remind us about how highly targeted um, high stakes things can get to be on the net. Um, I think that there are, you know, lots of implications here for what the documentation of the social record looks like and our ability to hang on to that documentation and to have continued confidence in its integrity. But let me get back to the sort of core issues around um, uh, around digital preservation for a minute. I want to say a few more things about that. Um, we saw published this year the um, report of the so-called Blue Ribbon Task Force on Sustainable Digital Preservation, um, which I had the privilege of serving on along with uh, several other people I see here. That was an attempt to really look at sort of the economics and the organizational strategies of preserving various kinds of digital data. Um, I can't say that I'm totally satisfied with the answers we found, but I think it was a helpful step forward, and I think it contains a number of messages, again, about life cycles of data, about the notion that stewardship responsibilities may change over time, that there's a lot of things we don't know about how long we want to keep various kinds of material and that patterns of keep it for 10 years, hand it off in a formal way, make a formal reassessment of it, um, may very well have their, their place as we try and find our way forward here. The last development I'll point to in the preservation area 
is the rise of new scale phenomena. And I see David Rosenthal here, for example, who has done some of the finest work on that and who uh, we've heard from um, in uh, recent uh, months about this. Um, what we're starting to see is a new set of phenomena both in computing and in data storage where basically um, the, the, the sort of simplest version of it is in a big enough system, things are always broken. And you need to be able to design the system so that it works even though some of the things in it are always broken. And you know that's been a theme of computing for uh, decades and decades. Um, once upon a time, they made computers out of vacuum tubes. And they had a terrible problem as they started making bigger computers out of vacuum tubes uh, because they'd never work or they'd work for a minute and then die um, because you'd blow tubes. And it turned out the way they fixed that, at least to start, is they decided to burn in the tubes before installing them because normal practice up till that time was you didn't kind of pre-burn in tubes, so you lost a lot of them to infant mortality. Um, and that let them get over that hurdle. Now we've actually got, you know, disks that are getting so big that the probability that you can read the entire disk, the physical disk, without an error is starting to get lousy. Um, so the notion of reconstructing things by reading the two disks that didn't fail um, isn't necessarily a really good strategy anymore. Um, and I mean, th there are much more technical ways to get into this, but I'm, I'm just trying to give you a flavor of what's happening is that we're, we're scaling up in computation and in storage to places where we need very different ways of thinking about systems. Uh, some of this work now is being taken up under the banner of uh, resilient system design. And um, it looks to me like this is going to have a very important kind of ongoing conversation with digital preservation in coming years. Let me turn to some other areas, though, where, um, we're, where we're, we have interests in the program plan and talk about a few developments. And um, maybe a place to start is um, mobile computing. Uh, we had a wonderful executive roundtable this morning on strategic planning for mobile computing. And it really is clear that some very interesting things are going on here. Um, this is not just about laptops and Wi-Fi. It's not just about cell phones. Um, we're actually starting to see the emergence of a bunch of other devices that sit in the middle. We're also starting to see the repurposing of extant things that may have started life as cell phones into distributed sensor things, image capture things, um, geolocation beacons, overlays through which to view the world. Um, uh, really completely new kinds of devices. Um, and uh, it's, it's very confusing what to make of, of some of this right now. Um, some of it is having significant social impacts. I mean, the, simply the notion, um, which is now old news, of putting a camera in everybody's pocket has had um, an awful lot of ramifications in um, news in transparency of the activity of public officials, um, all kinds of things uh, have changed as a result of that um, in pretty significant ways. I think we'll see a lot more change going on there. Um, one thing I do want to just note briefly because I think that the people here will be particular, who are often um, deeply concerned with access to information resources will resonate with this one. Once upon a time, back in 
the early 1990s, before web browsers, we actually had a sort of a, um, you know, a zoo full of one-off applications, clients that gave you access to one or a silo of information resources. And there were lots of these clients and lots of information resources. There were efforts to develop applications protocols like Z3950 that might let clients talk to different resources, but these seem to be fighting a constant uphill battle against various um, uh, suppliers who really wanted to keep things siloed. Well, now we have a very weird thing going on in the mobile world. Um, we started with web browsers that were the same as web browsers on laptops or desktop machines, except they just had really, really little screens and they were really, really slow. And then someone had the idea about, well, let's have mobile websites that basically kind of redesign the, um, the uh, information that's displayed to be more amenable to a very limited piece of screen real estate and take some of the more egregious flash and other garbage out of there. Um, now, but, but still, you know, giving you sort of a common tool that operated across lots of resources. Now we see the rise of the app. The one-off app on a mobile device that wants to talk to a specific information resource. And we actually see the population of these devices by hundreds of apps, each of which talks to one specific information resource. And there is at least some evidence, although the data I've seen is somewhat ambiguous, that um, at least some classes of users express a significant preference for apps as opposed to mobile, general purpose mobile web browsers. This is something that we really need to think very hard about as we think about our strategies for integrating um, mobile devices into a world of information resources. Um, it's a place we've been before. It's a place where um, there are definitely pros and cons. And also, there are some very real issues about market forces and lock-in here around certain kinds of content. And indeed, even the potential to have to relicense content that you already have in order to use that content in an app kind of ecology um, that bears some serious thinking about. Uh, so I note some of those as developments that we will be watching and thinking about. Let me say just a few words about some of the things that have been happening in the world of teaching and learning that I've been watching closely and that um, Joan Lippincott has also, of course, been um, heavily involved with. Um, although I, I, I want to stress that um, uh, in my comments here, I'm really putting my own personal spin on some of these things. Um, so we're seeing a maturation of the um, so-called learning management system marketplace. Um, certainly, these are well established now. Um, they're being indeed extended in some ways into collaboration environments, virtual research environments. Um, places where people can work with people and tools and data can meet um, and, and combine. Um, what's interesting to me about this is that while this is kind of maturing and moving off in a collaboration direction, um, my sense is that we're also starting to see a reemergence or a resurgence of some of the other kind of classical um, threads where computing gets involved in teaching and learning. For example, intelligent tutoring systems, computer-aided instruction, places where it's not so much about a faculty member 
packaging up material in a computational environment um, that the students can work through under the faculty member's guidance, where it's not about convenience tools to take attendance and give quizzes and things like that, but where the actual teaching is done with statistical models and interactively developed, highly personalized kinds of um, quizzes and things like that. Look at the kind of work um, uh, for, for examples of recent vintage of this, uh, some of the stuff that's coming out of Carnegie Mellon, for example. But there actually, there's a long, long history of this that um, you know, really never gained much traction I would say, in um, traditional higher ed, um, although it has an industry in some, in some niches, uh, which, ne which now is, is sort, of, sort of showing up as a set of parallel developments. And you know, some of the things that are feeding this, of course, are the interests in how to, how to teach a lot more people, particularly at the, um, you know, the community college level and things like this. Um, uh, often in kind of skills-oriented courses which lend themselves to this kind of treatment um, at lower costs. Um, invest, you're, seeing inve you're seeing this as a potential future for what does the textbook turn into that we can still sell for a whole lot of money. Um, as opposed to something that just kind of dissipates into captured lectures and um, op open, um, open educational materials. So I think there's quite a bit of, of stuff going on in that sphere that bears watching and if nothing else, um, I, I think reminds us of the importance of being clear about our language and about what we mean by learning management systems and how we distinguish them from some of these other developments. I will note also that um, there's another set of issues that I see on the horizon here. Um, there's been a lot of interest in learning spaces, in learning environments, in class redesign. Um, and so much of this really has at its heart the idea that you want to engage your students at a much deeper level than sitting and listening to lectures. And you want them to you know, take some responsibility for their own learning and for wanting to learn more and to delve deeply into topics that interest them and to be able to do that. And we've come up with wonderful things to help us, virtual learning environments, learning management systems, mobile systems, always available systems, very smart ideas about how students can learn from each other and collaborate. The thing I worry about here is saturation of the essentially engagement exhaustion. Imagine a student at the receiving end of five beautifully crafted courses all vying for his or her attention this way, 24 hours a day, opportunities to go deeper. Um, there's, some, there, there's a problem here. And the problem, I think, or at least a problem, is one of local optimization, if you will. We're optimizing at the level of the course. And I think that our successes here, and I think we are having successes, are going to force us to think about environments, programs, assessment, objectives at levels above the course, at levels of degree or certificate or mastering a certain body of material, sort of a more holistic view of what's happening to people that go into the educational process, particularly if they're not simply taking an isolated course but trying to master a body of material that spans time and courses. I think that's going to have some very very interesting 
interaction with some of the discussions about um, completion, about retention, about assessing student progress, about time to degree. Um, uh, but that this is a place where I'm looking for some unexpected consequences of progress. Um, a final place I just want to note in this area where we may be privy to a few unintended consequences is that we are, we, we've been, you know, busily building all these systems that collect immense amounts of data on students. Um, in the last year or two, we starting to, I'm starting to see a sort of an organized move to do the next obvious thing. After you've collected mountains of this data, start exploiting it to do good. Retention, measuring student progress, this sort of thing. All of a sudden we're hearing words like analytics um, in the context of student interactions in learning environments. Um, I have no question but that these things can be used in very constructive ways. I think though that unless we use them in wise ways and in transparent ways, um, we face a potential enormous unexpected consequence in the terms of, in terms of privacy explosions. If we're not clear with students about what data is collected, how it's used, who gets to see it, how, how long it's retained, and similar matters. I think we are very, very much at risk of um, losing the ability to make fruitful use of many of these um, data streams that are being established today. Um, I think this is an area that calls for tremendous sensitivity. Uh, you may have noticed that um, in the consumer markets, after basically years of um, you know aggressive consumer abuse in some cases, uh, we are starting to see slowly, probably ineffectually to be sure, the wheels of regulation move um, here. Uh, it's not clear to me that these are going to fix the consumer problems, but they are unquestionably going to complicate the operation of many people who are using the web to deal with consumers. It is very easy for me to believe that that same kind of development could transfer over into the teaching and learning sphere without uh, much trouble. All it will really take is a couple of good incidents. So I think this is an area where we need to be very careful and actually an area where some of the um, traditions and deliberations that um, have characterized uh, libraries work with, um, with uh, patron um, trails uh, could be potentially uh, brought to very fruitful play. There's lots more going on, and I don't have time to go over it all. Certainly, we see special collections, I think, uh, entering a new golden age um, as they become digital, as they encompass the digital. Um, there are fascinating, fascinating things going on as we look at the changing behavior of individuals uh, with regard to personal records and personal archives. Um, uh, CNI has been involved in helping with a couple of um, meetings, the second one of which will be in February of 11, looking at these developments. Um, we've actually seen, and uh, there's a session here, on um, the potential uses of forensic approaches to the management and understanding of personal collections. Uh, we're also starting to see the emergence of some conversations about um, what um, David Kirsch elegantly characterized as the public interest in private records. Um, this, is a, this is a frontier policy area, but one that I think will connect um, compellingly to both our, our issues about scoping the social um, record on one side and building the special collections of the 21st century on the other. 
we see many, many services now migrating out to the network level to use that kind of um, that that kind of discussion. Um, Certainly, we're seeing some very interesting um, developments in library-based services, in software-as-a-service kind of applications uh, for higher ed, um, potentially for scholarly disciplines as well. Um, there's an awful lot we don't understand there. One of the things that I find most fascinating that we really don't understand is what did databases look like in this world? And how did their properties change when we get into a world of diffuse and potentially linked data? What happens to questions about authoritative version of data, about um, editorial controls, um, about trust and authenticity in these kinds of environments? I think that as we see various forces inevitably pushing developments down that path, we're going to see um, much deeper engagement with these questions. One of the places it's already popped up, curiously, is with bibliographic records. Um, and I invite you to look at the history uh, over the last year or two of the discussions about what does it mean to have an authoritative database of bibliographic control um, in this kind of environment that's evolving. I think another place we're going to see it is names. Not just names in the sense of name authority, but a really complicated convergence between authorial names, um, uh, not just as represented by libraries dealing with the traditional monographic literature, but really reaching out for the first time to do authority control over the journal literature and the gray literature, the stuff in repositories as well as the stuff in journals, um, the kind of things that initiatives like ORCID are engaging, how that connects up to um, uh, databases of things like grant proposals and um, researcher interests, the sort of work that uh, projects like Vivo are doing. Um, how this again connects to diffuse databases of biography, of genealogy. You see bits of this in Wikipedia now, where everybody seems to have a Wikipedia entry all of a sudden. Um, there are very interesting um, projects, for example, in mathematics, there's the idea of the mathematical genealogy, where your children are the people you were thesis advisor for. And so you can actually trace genealogies of ideas and techniques through multiple generations. And people have actually built up a very significant database of genealogy and intellectual genealogy and mathematics and statistics. What happens when we start linking this into the author databases that are coming out of things like uh, ORCID? I think that um, it's going to be very interesting times to look at the evolution of data, um, uh, of various kinds of data resources in this world. A last place I want to identify as one where I think we're going to see a lot of rapid development is in the relationship between what campuses are doing and what's happening on a national level. Um, some of this is again coming out of cyber infrastructure work, um, comes out of identity management, network interconnection between local and national or international, computing in the sense of being able to federate computing and to move computations from campus to national level resources. It's also starting to show up now as we look at these data curation issues, the challenge of what should be institutional and what should be disciplinary. This, th this bridge or interconnect point or boundary seems to me to be a place where there's going to be a great deal of negotiation and a great deal of action taking place. So those are some of the things that have been very striking to me in the last year. 
some things that to me are really shaping our agenda going forward. I think you'll see a number of them represented in breakouts that we've listed uh, for, this set, for this meeting in reports that I've been sharing with you through CNI Announce. I think we'll see some of these reflected in this book we're going to do together in the spring meeting as well. We continue to look for other ways to connect with our members and our community. Um, one of the things we've been doing and will continue to do at this meeting is to take video of a number of sessions. We can't do all of them. We don't want to do all of them, actually. In fact, in some cases, um, uh, it's very clear that people don't want the sessions videotaped because they want them to be a, a sort of a free one-off discussion. Um, but we will be doing some video and making it available as we have in our last meetings. We've been running an experiment this year called CNI Conversations, where we op where um, uh, Joan Lippincott and I uh, do a phone call with about 40 minutes of reporting and then field questions. Um, that's been very interesting, and uh, we've had relatively light attendance on the Q and A, but very large numbers of downloads of the recordings of these. So what we're going to do next year is we're going to probably discontinue these as live sessions and replace them instead by more frequent and shorter recorded podcast type things. Uh, we may do an occasional live session on a topical basis around a sort of hot topic of interest, but I think, I think we will morph this one on to, um, to a more podcast uh, type model. Um, we will continue, though, to look at new ways to stay in touch, to communicate, and to connect with you as we explore these issues. Um, I hope you'll agree with me uh, that we really not just have had an interesting 20 years, but there's every reason to believe we're in for an extremely interesting 20 years to come, and I look forward to first speculating about them with you over the course of the next year, and then exploring them with you as we move on into the coming years. Thanks. And I think that went a tiny bit long, but we have a generous break. So if there are one or two questions that people have, I would be delighted to field them before we, um, we uh, have our break. David. Rosenthal from Stanford, just a quick uh, call you on something. You're repeating the propaganda about WikiLeaks. They have not dumped quarter of a million documents onto the internet. The only people who've seen the full dump are the media organizations who are filtering and retracting them. I think that's a, since this is the core of the case that's being pursued against WikiLeaks, it's important to be correct about this. Oh yes, that, that's absolutely correct. Uh, could everybody hear that? Okay, basically the, the bottom line there was particularly over the diplomatic uh, cables that WikiLeaks is, that, excuse me, WikiLeaks, I'm having trouble pronouncing that for some reason, um, is um, making available only a very small handful, a couple hundred are actually available now and they're mostly ones that the newspapers have written up. Um, but if you look at their previous uh, data dumps, those have been in, in very substantial volume. And I'm quite sure by the time we get all through here, um, we will see uh, these cables in volume too. Uh, I think, again, you know, it's really just very characteristic of, of the way of the world now um, that understanding what happens is buried in these huge databases. Um, uh, you look at um, what happens now in these investigations of, of failed or looted corporations, for example, um, Enron. Uh, uh, you know, they suddenly find themselves dealing with 
uh, half a million um, uh, documents and literally millions of email, and the challenge is sense making out of all of that. Um, it's a very, it's a very different kind of a world to be an investigator or a reporter in, um, among other things. But thank you, yes, for being clear on that, David. Um, other comments, questions? Uh, I see one coming here. Bill. Cliff, um, it was nice to hear your history of CNI 20 years ago. Um, either your memory is at fault or mine is at fault. I think the founder from Educom was Ken King, and maybe Richard West can tell, tell me if I'm right or wrong on this one. Richard West is nodding and saying it is true that that was Ken King before, um, before Bob came in there. And um, indeed, I believe you are right. Um, because Richard was there and was the emissary. And um, so we thank both Ken and Bob, uh, uh, both of whom were very helpful in those early years. Other questions or comments? Looks like we're ready for a break. I'm so glad you were all here. Just before you go, one quick reminder. Um, you all made it through the weather. There are a few people who didn't. Please keep an eye on the message board. If there are sessions that need canceled or rescheduled, we will try and post them there. But. Um, given the way the weather is, we're going to have to just do a few things by ear. Thanks again.